Uh, very excited for the class time that we're about to have here. Very glad to see uh, Dr. Mark Ward on here. I'm always, I always have a sense of relief when I look up and I see the teacher because um, I just know if the teacher isn't able to tune in, then I need to have a lecture prepared. So I'm definitely not going to have anything that's going to touch what Dr. Mark Ward is going to have to share with us today. So glad to see you here. Thank you for joining us. Um, excited also about the topics we're going to cover. Can I just toss this in here as we go? Um, this week we have, of course, today, I say this week, we have today the lecture uh, from Dr. Mark Ward, and we're going to be discussing tools. He is, I would say, uniquely qualified on that topic just because he's working specifically for a Bible software company, and so he's in these things all, every day. Uh, of course, Bible software is a proxy for a lot of stuff. So Bible software becomes a proxy as well for commentaries and other resources. Those are the things he's looking at. Um, before that, he worked at BJU Press. So it's just, Dr. Ward is significantly, has been significantly surrounded by resources for a long time. I mean, I just, this just hit my mind. The step before that, he was doing research at BJU, um, again, heavily involved in resources and reviewing periodicals and such. So he is very much qualified for what we're going to discuss here. And then on our next lecture on Monday, um, we will be discussing essentially the content from one book. If you wanted to pick this up, it would be a good idea. And it is Carson's, D.A. Carson's Exegetical Fallacies. It's a very good book. And we'll be working through a lot of that content, of course, adding things there. So that could be a great preparation. I mean, really, it's a small enough book. If you got it, maybe by Kendall, you could get through it this weekend. And if you did get through it over the weekend, it would, um, it would help you out as you're thinking about the course coming or the lecture coming up. Okay, what I said a second ago, I interrupted myself on. I, can I just toss this out? Uh, he, Dr. Ward has put in a lot of time on this class. In fact, I feel a little... Um, I feel a little like the amount that he agreed to and that we asked him to do is a bit excessive because of the time that he's invested. Uh, this lecture and then the next lecture, the last two lectures that we have, but a lot of time here. And he's also on the west coast of the U.S., which is actually the worst time zone that we have for all of us. Okay, so he's getting up very early to make this happen. Um, I just hope you appreciate, recognize what he's doing, appreciate, and recognize the sacrifice that's there. Everyone who's taught you is doing that completely volunteer. It's just out of love for the, these ideas, love for the truth and desire to, to communicate it. So anyway, my strong appreciation for what he's doing. I hope you recognize that. Um, and I hope you enjoy the lecture as much as I know the content deserves. <laughs> the content we're about to receive will be good quality stuff. Uh, looking forward to what we're going to hear. So um, I'm going to call here and um, let's see. Uh, I would ask, well, Brother Dennis, if you can hear me, I don't know if you can or not. Uh, if so, I would ask you to pray for us. Um, and I'm just looking across to see if you're able to tune in that way. If, um, if not, if I don't hear from you there, I'll ask if uh, Dr. Mike Peterson, would you be willing to pray for us? And I, I understand sometimes for some of you, it might be morning. So if you just want to turn on the microphone, I uh, didn't comb your hair, uh, no big deal. <laughs> so um, Dr. Peterson, if you're there or brother Dennis, if you're there, either one of you, please, uh, if you want to hit the mute and just, okay. So no mic on Dr. Peterson's. We'll try one more. Uh, brother Kenneth, I've heard this connection work well for you. So maybe I'll ask you if you can pray for us. If you're, if you are ready there. Okay. Let's, uh, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thanks even for this time that we can gather to even uh, study how we may understand your word. We pray, Father, for the teacher, even Dr. Mike Ward, that you will grant him special grace and uh, help us even to have a spirit of meekness, even as we approach your word. Um, be with everyone and guide us into your word and open our eyes to see wondrous things out of your, your truths. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Ward, the time is yours. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you again. And let's jump right in. We're going to talk about exegetical and theological tools for Bible study and theological study. 
Uh, it makes me think of a story that I now wonder if I've already told, but according to my notes, I haven't. It's a story that I've thought about so many times that I've been tempted to tell it too many times. And that is many years ago, I uh, remarked to a grad school friend that one of the goals that I had for my seminary education was to get myself to the place where I could write a good biblical commentary. And one girl in the group wrinkled up her nose and said, I can't think of anything more boring. She was a very smart girl, but she had grown up being told that scholarship deadens Bible study. She would never have thought that scholarship deadened her own academic field, in which she happened to be very proficient. In that field, the harder you worked and the more you studied, the more likely you were to know what you were talking about. But somehow, for her, biblical studies was quite different. Of course, her perspective was probably based in some undeniable experience. Maybe she had encountered some pretty dry theological eggheads. You know, head and heart ideally ought to work in concert for God's glory in every academic discipline, but it may be especially apparent when those two parts of us, and I put that in quotes because they aren't really parts, but maybe aspects or perspectives on us, when those two aspects of the human person don't work together, it's especially apparent during the, the, the study of theology. <clears throat> the, the migratory habits of swallows, maybe you could study a little bit dispassionately, uh, hopefully not if you're called to ornithology, uh, and, but you can still get the facts you need even if your, your passion isn't there. But Jonathan Edwards said that the emotional energy we bring to our sermons, whether sadness or joy or anger or what have you, is part of the message. You don't speak the truth of truly if your sermon on you are of more value than many sparrows doesn't echo with joy and gratitude. Now, commentaries do often have the reputation of being dry recitations of, of obscure facts. Uh, the reputation goes that they don't usually sing with the joy uh, or sorrow of the text. They dissect it. So it's no wonder that my friend had a negative opinion of them. And here's a second story, though, along the same themes, and then we'll evaluate them. I was eating dinner at a very fancy restaurant with two friends who were paying. They were wealthy folks. They both went to Furman University, and they were both evangelical Christians. Furman is a school with a reputation for attracting wealthy students. It's a private university. And we were talking about preaching and churches. And I made the offhand comment that, of course, my pastor is such a good preacher because he has a PhD in New Testament. And my one firm and friend wrinkled up her nose and said, you think that just because someone has a degree, he understands the Bible better than the rest of us? So I backpedaled because I didn't mean to offend the people that were paying for this very uh, expensive dinner. It didn't even occur to me that that comment would offend anyone. It just seemed so obviously true. Now, she too was a very bright girl who was studying at a prestigious and very expensive private university. Uh, but apparently she had grown up being told that anybody can understand the Bible as well as anybody else. Now, there's truth here, too, because diplomas on the wall and spiritual wisdom can sometimes work in inverse proportion to one another. And it's the privilege of every believer to know God personally and to study God's word on his or her own. But I have undeniable experience, too, um, internal and external. Internally, I just know that being forced to study by a teacher and a looming test, and a GPA, and an eventual dissertation, and living that way for years increased my own understanding of and appreciation for love for the Bible. I understand what I read now better than I did when I started, and that was my whole goal in embarking on my course of seminary study. Externally, I could also mention that the preachers I hear who have theological education who have sat through a lot of lectures like this one, are almost invariably more responsible with the text of Scripture, more searching in their applications, 
wiser in their theological positions than those who have less theological education. The two exceptions that I know personally, one living and one dead, are uh, that kind of exception that proves the rule. Each of them was made by God to be extra brilliant. Each of them has worked hard through the means available to them to, them to study and, and study hard. I'm certain that there are many, many more exceptions like this, but I don't know them personally. So I shudder to think what I would be saying in my sermons if I had not taken Old Testament theology in 2004 or New Testament word study in 2006. And I don't have to imagine it because I can go back and read sermons still sitting on my hard drive that I wrote before that time. But I don't do that because it's too embarrassing. It does not have to be prideful, but in fact, can be humble to say that more education means better Bible knowledge. It's humble because it makes a key admission. That is, without the divine gift of teachers, Ephesians 4, 11 to 12, I would be missing a lot while reading scripture. I can't or shouldn't rely on my own wits alone, and God does not mean for me to. My study has not made me less holy, more dry, um, less loving, more interested in, in minutia. Uh, but I, I sincerely hope that my study has made me more holy, more loving, both of God and neighbor. And with the amazing wealth of Bible study materials that are now available for free or very low cost compared to past ages, every Christian around the world can study hard. B.B. Uh, Warfield, the Princeton theologian, was so right when he said, sometimes we hear it said that 10 minutes on your knees will give you a truer, deeper, more operative knowledge of God than 10 hours over your books. And I'm betting many of you have heard that. And he says, what is the appropriate response? What? What about then 10 hours over your books on your knees? Why should you turn from God when you turn to your books or feel that you must... Uh, uh, turn from your books in order to turn from God. I've got a typo in my notes I'm going to fix because I'm going to share these notes with you uh, after the lecture. And I think that is such, such a wonderful quotation. Yeah, uh, you, you read that in the textbook because Andy Nacelli and I um, both, both really love that quotation. Now, having set up that uh, uh, our discussion of tools with those two stories, I want to go in and show you why it's not true that there's nothing more boring than writing a commentary. I want to show you why it is not true to think that someone uh, uh, can know the Bible just as well without studying it as much. And what are the best grammars, lexicons, word books, background books, translations, and commentaries, and pieces of Bible software, except the fruits of the labors of many, many people who have given their lives to study the text of Scripture. I want to start then uh, following right along with the outline provided me by Dr. Arnold with grammars, lexicons, and word books. Now, I see someone says that his internet connection is unstable due to bad weather. Let me just make certain that that's, that's just uh, uh, that one person and not everybody. Is everybody else able to see and hear just fine? Go ahead and say so in the comments or nod. Joel is good. Okay, good. Okay, just wanted to make sure of that. Thanks, everybody, for checking in. Um, I'm going to walk through the major kinds of exegetical tools there are, and I'm going to give you um, just one or two major examples, maybe a couple more in each category. <clears throat> and we will start with grammars. Now, discerning meaning in language is both something you do naturally, something that you can't help doing naturally, and something that you can refine through education. You have always known, ever since the first days of your ability to understand language, before you could even speak it, you've always known intuitively the difference between a noun and a verb. You might make some mistakes in speech, um, but they were easily corrected, and by age four or five, you were not making those mistakes, even possibly by age three. Um, you never said, 
I the tree, or I the climb tree. You said, I'm gonna climb the tree. You knew the difference between major categories of speech, but you didn't have labels. And you didn't have, you didn't know always the difference, uh, where the borderline was uh, between words, whether sidewalk was one word or two. <clears throat> Um, grammar in particular is about observing patterns within sentence structures and that, that you can make up on your own just fine, but, but training yourself to observe them and then label those patterns so that you can find more of them. There's the key. When you have a label as simple as noun or verb or adjective and a basic idea of what each accomplishes in a sentence, you suddenly see things that you weren't really able to see before. Labels enable you to single out elements of meaning and raise them up to your view for analysis. They involve interpretation, these labels do. <clears throat> and I'm just going to mention one Greek grammar and a couple Hebrew grammars, and we're gonna spend almost all our time really on the Greek grammar because it'll be emblematic of all grammars, Greek and Hebrew. We're going to talk about Daniel B. Wallace's Greek Grammar Beyond the Basics. And I have a feeling that Joel can bring that up on his screen and show it to us all. Grammars are not neutral descriptions, nor are they the secret key to certainty in Bible interpretation. And Wallace very helpfully acknowledges these things in the intro to his grammar. <clears throat> he has a motivation in the work that he's done. He is trying to serve the work of the church by serving good biblical interpretation. And I'm going to spend some time here on this prolegomena in a grammar. I want to quote for you a couple key comments from Wallace, which I cannot believe I did not read back when Wallace was first assigned to me many years ago. I stupidly skipped this intro, and there is gold here. I'm not going to let you skip it. I'm going to read it to you. Not the whole thing, but some key paragraphs. This is what Wallace said. My motivation from the beginning, from the beginning, that is, of his time teaching Greek back in the late 70s at Dallas Seminary. He says, my motivation has not changed. It is to encourage students to get beyond the grammatical categories and to see the relevance of syntax for exegesis, for the study of scripture, that is. As one who teaches both grammar and exegesis, I have felt this need acutely. Typically, by the time a student finishes intermediate Greek, disillusion and demotivation have set in via death by categories. Greek grammars have a strong tradition of giving laundry lists of the various morphosyntactic uses, coupled with a few illustrations. This follows the model of classical grammars, which canvas many corpora, which is bodies of texts, and he says, for the idioms of any language must be based on unambiguous examples. But he says, with such an approach for the New Testament, the student can easily get the artificial impression that the syntactical labels will almost naturally attach themselves to the words in a given passage, thus rendering exegesis as a black and white science. So if you've studied any Greek or read any commentaries without studying Greek, you might have seen grammatical categories like genitive absolute or dative of place and these various morphosyntactic uses may be listed there in, in a grammar and given along with illustrations that are unambiguous and you might get the artificial impression wallace says that these labels are very easily attached to words in a given passage and as long as you know the labels and have the passage in front of you there are no judgment calls to make. You can just put the labels on there. <clears throat> I love this, I, what Wallace says. Uh, on the one hand, his scholarly work and decades of teaching experience are dedicated to the, the appropriate end, understanding the Bible. But on the other hand, Wallace doesn't promise too much. Interpretation is art and it is science. This goes back to our talk about the value of the original languages. Rarely will a good interpreter solve an acknowledged hermeneutical difficulty by recourse to Greek or Hebrew. If it were that easy to solve, someone smarter than you and me would have done it already. God has placed some difficulty into his word. There are things that are hard to understand. Peter says it about Paul's writings. 
That's not going to go away now that we have Bible software. It will re remain the case throughout all of our lives that there are Bible difficulties. But there is science involved, and science in one of its very simplest garbs, empirical description. Grammar at its best is an inductive look at how, in fact, people use or used, in the case of a dead language, how they used the language in question. But what do people generally mean when they use a given expression or sentence structure? Perfect black and white certainty is not always going to be available. In fact, I'm going to say it's relatively rare. But neither are we stuck struggling through a bathtub full of gray paint. Here's Wallace again. He says, once a little exegesis is under the student's belt, the opposite and equally false impression emerges that exegesis is the art of importing one's views into the text by picking a syntactical label that is in harmony with one's pre-understanding. This is so good. He says, the former attitude views syntax as a cold and rigid tax mas taskmaster of exegesis. It's 5.22 a.m. over here, by the way, so any mispronounced words are not my fault. He says that the, the former attitude views syntax as equally indispensable and uninteresting, whereas this latter view assumes that the use of syntactical labels in exegesis is simply a Wittgensteinian-like game that commentators play. That is, the cleverest commentator is the one, and this is me here summarizing Wallace, the, the cleverest commentator is the one who can come up with the labels that persuade everybody else and make his view seem scholarly. Here's Wallace again. He says, too much exegesis is not properly based on syntax. Too many works on syntax show too little concern for exegesis. He's setting up the two poles here. He says, the result of this dichotomy is that intermediate students don't see the relevance of syntax, that is, of grammar, of the word order, of the structure of the sentences. Um, they don't see the relevance of, relevance of syntax for exegesis. And exegetes often misuse syntax in their exegesis. This work, Daniel Wallace's Greek Grammar Beyond the Basics, attempts to offer an initial corrective to this situation by properly grounding the exegesis in the idioms of the language and by orienting the syntax to its exegetical value. Now that's pretty thick. So let me do a little bit of explaining. I think this is absolutely brilliant on the part of Wallace and a great example of why uh, the work of scholarship is so important to the church. He wants to properly ground the exegesis of scripture in the idioms of the Greek language. That is by looking at example after example after example, both in the New Testament and outside of it in his own study. He is able to make accurate generalizations about what a given sentence structure means. And that is what dictionaries and grammars, and we'll talk more about dictionaries later, that's what they all do. They are works of observation and description. They did not fall out of heaven. They are the work of people in a long tradition observing what, in fact, does a given construction or word mean. And then Wallace says he wants to orient his study of syntax to its exegetical value. His goal is to help you understand the Bible, and what a brilliant goal. That's great. I, I cannot believe I so stupidly skipped reading this intro. It was just fantastic. I don't think I was ready to receive all this wisdom back then. And that's one of the most sobering realities of education and of life. But now I get it. This is gold. So after all this prolegomena, what does Wallace's grammar actually accomplish and how does it do it? <clears throat> what Wallace does is he lays out all the major grammatical labels grammarians use, and there are a lot of them, and he gives examples. These labels were not invented by God, like I said. They weren't revealed to us in a special appendix in scripture. They are a combination of the consensus effort of men and of traditions going back to who knows when. One such traditional label is the predicate nominative, called that because it names, uh, nominative comes from Latin's nomen, which is name, and before that actually Greek's onomastike. Um, it names uh, in the predicate, I'm going to add this to my notes here because I didn't finish the sentence. 
something in the beginning of the sentence, namely the subject. And here is what Wallace says. The predicate nominative is approximately the same as the subject and is joined to it by an equative verb, a verb uh, I'll add like is, that just connects the two things and says they're basically equal. Whether that verb is stated or implied, Wallace says. He says this usage is very common. The equation of the subject and the predicate nominative does not necessarily or even normally imply complete correspondence. So it's not like in logic where A equals B and B equals A, like a mathematical formula. Rather, the predicate nominative normally describes a larger category or state to which the subject belongs. What you're supposed to do with this is keep the label in your mind, predicate nominative. And as you're reading along in the New Testament, you're supposed to notice, oh, this is a good candidate for predicate nominative. What was a predicate nominative again? Let me go look it up in Wallace. Aha, he gives me a description. And you're supposed to apply this description to the passage. It doesn't necessarily or even normally imply complete correspondence or interchangeability, but uh, describes a larger category to which the subject belongs. So even in a relatively dry description of the predicate nominative, Wallace has his eye on exegetical and interpretive value. And of course, he gives examples of the predicate nominative. But Wallace goes further than giving examples. Like he said in his, in his, in his introduction, <clears throat> he, does, he doesn't want merely to give the unambiguous examples. He wants to do, he, 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 he chooses also a number of what he calls exegetically significant examples. And he does the exegesis right in front of you. In fact, people often use Wallace as a commentary by checking the index for whatever passage they're studying. And I must say, this is particularly easy to do if you have Wallace in Logos Bible software. Um, here's one such significant exegetical example Wallace gives, probably the most important predicate nominative in the New, in the New Testament. John 1.1 1, 1 in Greek reads, Halagos ein prostante an kai thaas ein halagos. The word was with God and the word was God. Wallace explains um, very briefly, but pregnantly, and I actually heard a, a Muslim debater in uh, Johannesburg, South Africa uh, on YouTube, I didn't get to go there, but he, he quoted Wallace here. Wallace is an evangelical authority on Greek. He says, a subset proposition is envisioned here. The logos belongs to the larger category known as Theos, that is, the word belongs to the larger category known as God. The force of this construction is most likely to emphasize the nature of the word, not his identity. That is to say, the word is true deity, but he is not the same person as the Theos, the God, mentioned earlier in the verse. Wallace is doing um, exegesis in the tradition of Trinitarian theology, but he's digging into uh, grammar and making careful observations of syntax, which is where our theology should be grounded. Wallace does not overpromise. This is commentary involving human judgment. It's not all science. But like with this comment, it is generally representative of how far the grammatical science has gotten us. Now, after uh, the clear illustrations of a particular category are noted, Wallace says, there frequently will be ambiguous and exegetically significant examples like the one I just mentioned. This one's not very ambiguous, although there, there are dis disagreements about it. Uh, even among professing believers of scripture, not just Muslims. But it also encourages, um, uh, th th this, this, this approach, uh, Wallace says, makes syntax more interesting, but it also encourages the student to begin thinking exegetically and to recognize, again, that syntax does not solve every exegetical problem. That is Wallace. I am curious, and could you tell me by raise of hand or a mention in the chat, how many of you have used Wallace's Greek grammar beyond the basics already? Let me know. Okay, we've got, got at least one. Okay, great. <clears throat> okay, a couple people 
who have a couple people just a little bit. Good. Just wanted to get a, um, a little sense of that. Okay, then I'm going to move on to um, Hebrew grammars. And I'm really just going to kind of tick these off one by one because they are similar to, um, in basic respects, to what Wallace did. So I don't need to give an explanation of how they work so much. But I need to mention the standards here. And um, if ever you need to look at the standards, bestcommentaries.com, which, which was your very easy homework this week, um, is a great place to go for not just commentaries, but also recommendations on Greek grammars and background books. There's a whole bunch of categories there of recommended books. Some of them are pretty thin, some of them are thicker, but you can look up and see uh, the all four books I'm about to mention, Hebrew grammars, there as well. Uh, Matthew Rowley says he has used Greek grammar beyond the basics, but he needs to use it more. And that is exactly what I concluded when I did this study. I thought, I need to get back into using this guy more often. Um, back to Hebrew, though. Uh, Bruce Waltke, Waltke and O'Connor are the standard Hebrew grammar that I was handed in my Hebrew course. It's called Introduction to Biblical Hebrew Syntax. Uh, I don't know exactly how to pronounce this, but Juan Muraoka, and I misspelled that in my own notes. His grammar of biblical Hebrew is another. Gesenius's Hebrew grammar is much older, but still useful, very useful, and uh, still does get used in schools. And Christo van der Meewe's, uh, again, another pronunciation problem perhaps, biblical Hebrew reference grammar is one I have not used, but have heard good things about. Uh, Christo is a longtime user of Logos Bible software, was excited about it from the very beginning, has been involved in producing some of our resources. And though none of these, in my experience, is quite as clear and as useful for evangelical exegesis as Wallace, um, and that's probably more reflective of my ability in Greek versus Hebrew than anything else, uh, they all basically do the same things. They lay out grammatical categories, they explain them, and they give examples, and they offer some guidance on hard cases. In my experience, Wallace is the, the one who is most focused on exegetical value. Um, and, and that's why he has risen to the top among intermediate grammars. But there are your Greek and Hebrew grammars. <clears throat> And now I want to move along to lexicons. Now, I am going to try to share my screen for the first time, which I realize is um, something I should have done previously. There is a very nerdy book that I want to recommend to you. Um, here we go. A History of New Testament Lexicography by John A. L. Lee. It's in a series by a Swiss publisher, which unfortunately is fairly expensive. Maybe, just maybe, you could get it in a library. But this book is not only nerdy, but extremely entertaining. Now, you have to be a nerd to be entertained by this, um, but if you have even a little bit of nerdiness, I purchased this way back in 2007 and read it cover to cover, and it is actually hilarious in parts. It's, it's one of those scholarly books that has real personality. I just loved it. Um, basically, the point of what John A. L. Lee does in this book is to show that um, the next item we're going to talk about, which is lexicons, basically dictionaries of Greek and Hebrew, um, that that these things did not fall out of heaven, um, that they exist in a long tradition, that there are mistakes, unfortunately, that can last for centuries because each lexicon uses the previous lexicon as a basis. Nobody starts from scratch. Uh, in fact, as best we can tell, and as I recall from this book, um, some of the earliest work in Greek lexicography relies on works that the Greeks themselves did. So this is a long, long, long tradition. 
And like all long, long, long traditions, encrustations can form and uh, little problems can develop. And we're talking about little things. We're not talking typically about massive mistakes that will uh, have a massive impact on biblical doctrines. In fact, I can't think of a single example there. Uh, but we want to get our understanding accurate as much as we can in biblical studies. And the, to, to be made aware of the humanity of the work of making dictionaries, I think is important. Um, and there's, there's a reason I'll get to for why it's so important. But I want to talk about several Greek lexicons that are standard in the study of the New Testament, and then talk about how to use them and how to think about them. First off, let's just ask the question, how does the dictionary know? Uh, if you have an upbringing at all similar to mine, you would at times ask your parents, Dad, what does this word mean? Like, elemosinary. And we talked about that in our philosophy of language discussion. And dad or mom would commonly say, this is more of a mom thing to say, look it up, dear. Where are you supposed to look it up? Well, you go to the dictionary. When you're a kid, you are probably not aware that there is no the dictionary. There are multiple dictionaries, and there are, I wouldn't say disagreements per se between them, although I think I've discovered a few um, over the years because I am an inveterate checker of dictionaries. Uh, but there would be differences of emphasis. Maybe in one dictionary, um, peruse will mean uh, the first sense will be to look over something carefully, and the second sense will be to, uh, to skim something. And in another dictionary, those two senses will be reversed. Usually the first sense in the dictionary is the, is the most common sense. Um, little differences like that appear in dictionaries. And I find, like I kind of found when I asked you in a previous lecture, thank you for looking up inveterate, that's funny, Matthew. Um, I, I found that um, most people don't really think about how the dictionary got to them. And I know that, uh, not to put you all on the spot too much, that most of you did, have not thought sufficiently until at least recently about how dictionaries got to you because you all told me that you'd never looked at the list of editors in the front. Now here are these editors giving you usage notes, telling you how to use words, in English of course, and um, you, I, it's striking that people in general would not even look to find out who are these people who are giving me this advice? Why would I want to listen to them in particular? We just invest this authority in dictionaries and we don't ask questions. Well, I think we've got to ask this question, how does the dictionary know? The dictionary knows what words mean, and we talked about this some in a previous lecture. Uh, the dictionary knows what words mean by, by examining their usage both in writing and in speech, especially, however, in writing. That's the tradition, especially, and I know the tradition largely of English dictionaries. The Oxford English Dictionary, which is the supreme English dictionary, absolutely massive. I mean, we're talking volumes and volumes and volumes here, is so large because it is giving every historical usage of every single English word there is, and it is uh, giving historical examples, little excerpts. That is the ideal dictionary because you can check up on their work and examine it. Um, the, the work of a dictionary is essentially descriptive. It does not have any authority in and of itself to tell you what words should mean. Its job is to tell you what words in fact do mean. And by that I mean what people mean when they use those words. People are the agents of meaning. Words don't mean without people. You know, it's like that old question, if the tree falls in the middle of the forest with no one there to hear it, did it make a sound? Well, God is always observing in every corner of the galaxy. So yes, meaning can occur whether humans exist or not. But on the level of human language, uh, a word 
any word like paper or fairly or compliment or lexicographer or koine or Greek words like arsenokoites or aper or epeper, words we're going to discuss briefly in a moment. These words don't have meaning until humans mean by means of them, until we use them as tools to say things to others. The best lexicons all perceive that that's what they're doing. They're describing the way Greek words were, or Hebrew words were actually used. The standard Greek English dictionary is BDAG, Bauer, Dunker, Arndt, and Gingrich. <clears throat> and the key name there is actually the second, Dunker. Although Bauer is the founder of this tradition uh, of editions of this ultimately German, uh, German English dictionary, uh, Donker, the late, was the late American editor of the most recent edition, which came out in 2000. And Donker, Frederick W. Donker, was very meticulous, very gifted. The book is both magisterial and beautiful. It's a fantastic volume. And I wrote a paper last year looking up almost every single reference that Donker made to other literature in his jam-packed entry on the word arsenokoites. And I'm going to share my screen again, just a minute, and show you this um, paragraph that he wrote, very jam-packed on arsenokoites. Let me share my screen. Here is desktop one, and let me put that in the middle of the screen here. Okay, here's BDAG, and here's the entry on arsenokoites. Now, I have a visual filter turned on in Logos, and where did it go? I forget how I turn this on now, but you can view, this is bad, I'm a Logos Pro, I should know this. Um, oh, here we go, duh. If you turn off outline formatting, you just see one big fat paragraph, and this it can be overwhelming, so I like to uh, turn on outline formatting in Logos, which you cannot do with the paper copy, unfortunately. And it puts the bullets in points that makes it easier to get into all this stuff. This is the Greek word for homosexual. And um, it has become a battleground uh, over the last 30, 40 years um, because the, the people out there who wish to uh, justify homosexual activity. One of the one of their strategies is to say that this uncommon word. In fact, Paul appears to have invented this word. They say that it doesn't mean what the modern English translations commonly say that it means. That it has reference to exploitative sexual activity. Um, I brought up this issue several times because it's. It's a, helpful, um, it's a helpful issue to raise for hermeneutics because it's so controversial right now uh, and because it calls up you know, all the disciplines of hermeneutics. And here we're talking not about theology, but about lexicography. How can we discern what arsenokoites means? Well, what, what, uh, what Donker does is really magisterial. I'm sure he's working on uh, the basis of what Bauer and the German editors of the original uh, German version of this uh, lexicon did. Um, you know, it occurs to me that is one thing that I failed to check. I, I really do need to go and look and see what did he get from Bauer and what did he uh, generate on his own. Um, but there are multiple English articles and books here that I'm presuming Bauer did not find. So seems to me that most of this work comes from Donker. But what Donker does is he gives you the etymological elements of this word, arsane, male, plus coite equals bed, in the sense of bedding somebody down. This is a sexual term. Um, uh, he's not saying that words mean what their, what their etymology says they mean, but he's still providing that help. And then he starts giving obscure references, uh, bardisanes. Um, and you know what, I, if I pull up my paper on this, 
Um, you know, that's probably going to take a little bit too much time. Uh, basically, all of these references that he's making are to uses of the word that occur, in this case, after the time of the New Testament, and therefore, of course, outside of the New Testament. Other words that he gives reference to, he'll give references from the first century, but not in the New Testament. But this one, since it was invented, probably by Paul, all the references come from later. Um, he, he uses a lot of abbreviations, and to unpack all these takes some time. But I did that for my paper. I looked up almost every single last reference and followed his argument. And what I discovered was that he is making an argument. He is raising by giving these examples of books um, and articles, uh, like one that I spent a lot of time on, and where did it go? It's in here. Where did it go? He's, he cites, uh, here we go, um, Dale Martin in an article called Biblical Ethics and Homosexuality. Um, he, when he cites a point, he says, differently, check Dale Martin. So he's engaged in an argument in this tiny little paragraph. I, I call it huge and tiny. Well, essentially, it's tiny compared to the amount of words that could be said about this. And he has distilled a lot of material down to a small paragraph. Um, his argument is basically that because arsenokoites is set in contradistinction to malakos, uh, um, it's actually plural in that passage, malakoi, in 1 Corinthians 6, um, because it's set against this word that means soft, and therefore the, the object of um, homosexual penetration, um, that it must mean the active participant. One, he says, one who assumes the dominant role in same-sex activity. This is an argument. This is not merely a description because the, the facts of the New Testament could be and are described in other ways, and he acknowledges that. Dale Martin um, argues differently about this word <clears throat> in a very interesting article, actually which I summarize in my paper, and I link to, my, to an audio version of my paper uh, in the notes that you'll get. Um, the, the argument doesn't end there. He goes back and forth with his different citations, and when you look them up, you realize, I see, okay. He is um, arguing against the views of these people. For example, he says, Paul's strictures against same-sex activity cannot be satisfactorily explained on the basis of alleged temple prostitution and he gives some uh, citations for that. Now, that is one of the strategies that existed already in the 80s or 90s or whenever he was working on this. <clears throat> um, I think the most recent uh, reference is in the early 90s, so presumably that's when he was working on this. Um, at that point, that argument was already put out there in public. Not... It, it's, it's rare that you're going to need to dig into the argument over the meaning of a given word um, in this way. But Donker has done the incredible work, along with other lexicographers, of putting all this information out there together for you. And you can track it down yourself. Um, most, uh, let me think, I, I think all of the references that I uh, looked up for this paper I think all of them were available online. Uh, a good question here, someone asked, where is this word used in scripture? He, he, it, Donker will frequently reference that, um, and he does here. It's two places, 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, which is actually the ESV's rep way of rendering um, arsenokoites and uh, malakos. Uh, it's just plural, so arsenokoitai and malakoi. Um, they're putting these two things together and translating it, with, translating it with the phrase men who practice homosexuality. I think that's appropriate. First Timothy 1.10 is the other place. Similarly, a vice list of the sexually immoral men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. Those are the two places in the New Testament where that word is used in scripture. Um, as I was saying, it's rare that you'll need to dig into a word this much, <clears throat> but this is a good example of a kind of word where you will. 
Um, because in a vice list, you don't have much context to help elucidate what a given word means. You have the context of all of scripture, and that is totally relevant um, because uh, you, you know something about Paul. He's a Jewish man who is trying to, um, trying to be utterly faithful to the Old Testament. And of course, because we believe he's inspired, we believe he was utterly faithful to the Old Testament. Um, would, would Paul invent a word, arsenokoites, out of these two elements, male and bed, male betters, would he invent a word in order to circumvent or undermine the traditional biblical Jewish proscription against same-sex sexual activity? Uh, at the very least, if this was Paul's intent, I should use the subjunctive, if this were Paul's intent, he would have had to say a good deal more. The New Testament upholds the standard in Matthew 19 of... Uh, of creation. That is that God made man and female and made them to be together. And that is the standard. Lifelong monogamy between um, members of the opposite sexes and just two of them, unless one of their spouses dies. And of course that comes in after the fall. Um, but because this word is disputed, you've got to sometimes do the work like I did last year and looking up every single reference and trying to trace the argument of a real expert lexicographer. I must say, this is the only time that I've looked up every single reference, but I was deeply impressed with what uh, Donker did and definitely recommend his work to you. Now, I uh, have a link in the notes to a loving tribute to BDAG by Rod Decker, who um, is a great conservative scholar, also recently passed away from cancer. Uh, interestingly, Donker is, was, because he's passed away too, a theological liberal, but he's one of those fair-minded theological liberals who does the work of description with a degree of appropriate objectivity, not complete objectivity. You cannot be completely objective when you're describing the New, Test the New Testament. You are going to have a position, and he took a position on that particular word. I think he took the right position, and I found it particularly powerful. I always have when a liberal takes my position. Uh, we could quibble here with some of his judgments, um, but the man gave years of his life to this project, not to mention years of his life to gaining the ability to give yet more years of his life to Greek lexicography. We owe him, along with so many other scholars, a great debt of gratitude. Um, what an interesting world we live in where Christians could look at that careful work and turn up their noses as if this egghead is arrogant merely to claim that he knows something about the Bible that I don't. That is unbelievable hubris and arrogance. I, I just, I can't fathom it. Um, and unfortunately, that is all too common among people we, uh, who believe the Bible. We ought to bow down in reverence, figuratively speaking, not in worship, but in gratitude to these men and women who've done this kind of scholarly work for us. It's a massive assistance to us. I'm going to spend most of my time on lexicons on uh, BDAG, and we're coming toward the end of our hour. Um, but I want to, before we, uh, we're going to, we're going to take a little bit more than an hour on this and then have our break. Um, the next lexicon I have to mention is Low Nida. It's the, their work is called the Greek English Lexicon of the New Testament based on semantic domains. And that's the key, based on semantic domains. This is a close second New Testament lexicon in my book, and I would call it a necessary complement. It lays out lexical data in an innovative way um, that is sensitive to modern linguistics. Lo and Nida uh, R were, I believe they're passed away, I guess I'm not sure about that. I should know. Um, they were linguists. They were uh, particularly, in the case of NIDA, Bible translators and uh, basically philosophers, theorists about Bible translation. And conservatives have had some things to complain about in their work. Um, I don't complain as much as most other conservatives that I'm around. So let me, uh, 
let me put this in the notes here. Loanida's Greek English lexicon based on semantic domains. There you go. I just put it in the uh, in the chat. Um, semantic domains means that they have arranged the um, the uh, they've arranged the New Testament uh, lexical stock according to domains of meaning. So, um, you know, the easiest way for me to do this would be to pull it up and show it to you. Uh, I don't want to spend actually too much time on it, but I'm going to pull it up in Logos. Lonida's semantic domains. Oops. Here we go. Johannes P. Lowe and Eugene Nida. Let me excerpt that, make it a little bigger. If I look up arsenicoites here, it's in one domain. Domain 88 is moral and ethical qualities and related behavior. And in domain 88, there are subdomains. Goodness is one. And within goodness, there would be multiple words, agathos, as well as akakos. So this is an antonym. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not. No, no. This is akakos. This is uh, without fault, and hence dialus. Um, agatha poieo, doing good. Kalas, uh, positive moral quality. Here are multiple words within this semantic domain. And actually, they can occur in multiple semantic domains because words can have multiple senses. Um, I should probably switch these two things here. There we go. So look on the left, you see the domain. Look on the right, you can see the words in that domain. Um, Arsenicoites, where did that land again? That was in what domain? I thought it was in, let me see here. Look it up again. 88.280. And once you look up a word, you can find the domain. Okay, it's down here in sexual misbehavior. J prime is the domain there. And you can find all the other words that are listed in this domain. Why is this significant? This is very significant because words, words work not only on their own, but in contradistinction to and in overlapping relationship with synonyms. So one of the ways we know what arsenicoites means is that Paul will use it in contexts in which other words like porneia and oselgeia are used. And people don't usually use words that mean exactly the same thing right next to each other unless they do it uh, for some kind of rhetorical effect that they will signal in other ways. But in a vice list, like 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 1 Timothy 1, 10, where arsenicoites is used, um, usually the other words exist in some kind of contradistinction to, uh, to the one you're studying. So if you can, if you know what porneia means and aselgeia, you'll know that, okay, arsenicoites does not mean these things, that, that those elements of the semantic domain are already taken up. So it's very helpful to look at all of the words within the semantic domain, basic domain. You're basically looking at, um, Impurity, fornication, and adultery. Let's see anything else that occurs there. Um, oh, okay, a variation on, in fact, here's a whole phrase, going after strange flesh, which is also a reference to homosexuality. And here's malakos, uh, and here's a here's the reference, uh, kuon, to um, probably also in part to homosexuality. Somebody has got their mic on here. Probably use it off. Um, that is a very helpful way to study uh, the Greek lexical stock, and that's why I say this is a complement to BDAG. If you notice, it does not give the same kind of scholarly references. I'm not seeing any here to usage outside the New Testament uh, or to other discussions, but it very helpfully examines usage that's actually in the New Testament. I'm going to stop the share, go back to, okay, good question. Is this book or software? This is a book. However, I have never used Lonida. You know, I'm not, 
No, I have seen Lonida in, in person, in physical codex form. Um, but I use it in Lagos, and before that, I used it in BibleWorks. Um, because, all, and we're going to talk about this later, reference works most typically are, are more useful in, um, uh, in software form, I find. Because you can have easier access to them, all the flipping that goes back and forth in a codex, especially in a book like this, where you've got to look it up first in kind of the index, and then you've got to move over uh, and look it up in among the semantic domains. It's, it's just more effort than you're actually going to go to sometimes. And uh, it's good to let the software do it for you. In general, again, reference works work best in, uh, in software. Now I said we're gonna take a break uh, after more than an hour has passed, but I spent a little longer on Lone Nida than I intended to, had some good questions there. So I think we should take our break now. And when we come back, I will talk a little bit more about uh, lexicography through a special tool in Logos that I wanna show you, which you can use to do your own lexicography. Then we will talk about background books extremely briefly, and then my briar patch, Bible translations, and then commentaries. And we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to go quickly to get through it all, but you've done well, at least you appear to have done well. Uh, and other lectures letting me go this fast, and we'll be back when Joel says we'll be back. Joel? If Joel has stepped away, then I will proclaim that in five minutes we'll be back, and that means 6.08 a.m. See you at, well, whatever 08 a.m. or p.m. your time. See you then.
Okay, <clears throat> we're back. It's 6.08 a.m. here, and I'll pick up quickly on a comment from Caleb Schaff. The one thing that I wish Logos had that is in Bible works is the leading New Testament sentence diagrams. And uh, we'll talk more about software at the end. Um, that is a very helpful tool. And uh, I almost hate to say this because I really love Bible works and appreciate those guys. But um, you can print Leedy's diagrams to PDF and use them on your own without having to call up Bible Works. Uh, you should not share them if you do that. You should own them. Um, but you don't have to use Bible Works to take advantage of those uh, New Testament diagrams. Okay, let's move on. And I will. Uh, do a little more talk about uh, grammars, lexicons, and word books. I, I didn't even mention the theological word book of the Old Testament, but it is essentially a lexicon like the others we've been talking about. I'll mention briefly Halot, which is the Hebrew Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament. That's the standard Hebrew lexicon. I'll mention briefly that Lagos has a tool worth looking at that is something like the low nida tradition it's called the bible sense lexicon it arranges semantic domains in semantic trees um, but i wanted to mention to you that i actually don't use lexicons uh, a, as much as some other new testament exegetes do and maybe that's a function of my my laziness i hope not uh, but i think it's partly a function of my calling um, what I actually have to do in the New Testament day by day, and also of my gifting and training. Because I was trained by Randy Leedy, in fact, in a good philosophy of words. It's something I've dug into for years now and something I've really hoped to dig into further as the years go by. I love linguistics. And I have worked to develop some of the skills of a lexicographer like Donker. Uh, there are definitely some skills I'm lacking. Donker is way above me. Um, primarily the ability to read Koine Greek from outside the New Testament. That's something that my training simply did not cover and is very difficult for me. Uh, a skill I'd love to have, but have not yet taken the time to develop on my own. However, within the pages of scripture, I can readily look at how a given word was used, uh, and I can do it by myself without the help of lexicons. So just the other day, I was working on a project called the KJV Parallel Bible, and I'm actually going to share a link with you that I would ask that you not share with anyone else because the project is not yet um, made public, but I would encourage you to take a look at that on your own time. I think I shared that link with you earlier in notes, but um, I'm going to show you on the screen what it looks like very briefly because I am so excited about it. KJVParallelBible.org sets up um, the first tool of its kind. You are able through this tool to view the New Testament uh, uh, text. And why is it not coming up? You're able to view uh, the, basically the differences between the Textus Receptus, Greek text, of the New Testament and the, uh, the modern critical text, the Nesalon 28, and actually see the differences for yourself in English. And I, oops, I am not getting it to come up. So let's see here, come on. KJV Parallel Bible, there we go. Okay, on, in, the, in the column on the left is the King James as it stands in the in the 1769 revision that most people have on their laps. And on the right is the King James as it would be if, um, oh, I see, everybody clicked at once, so no, it didn't open for anybody. The, 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 uh, the King James as it would be if it were based on the critical text. <clears throat> um, as if someone went back in time and handed an Esalon 28 to the King James translators and they used it. And everything else they did was exactly the same, but only the places where the critical text and the text receptus differ, uh, only in those places are there differences between these two texts. And in, in the first four verses or five verses of the New Testament, there are no differences. 
In the sixth verse, here's our first difference. The TR has the words David the king twice, whereas um, the critical text has the king only once. So I bold that difference. The next difference is all the way down in verse 18. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph versus when his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph. These are the kinds of differences that occur in the manuscript tradition. <clears throat> and um, these are the two major options. Every time you work, uh, go to buy any Bible around the world, you're either going to buy one where the New Testament was translated from the Textus Receptus or from the critical text. Now, why is this significant? And I'm, I'm doing this so fast here. It might take a little time. You might want to take a little time to try to follow this afterwards. Um, but I, I had the one difference in, uh, between the two texts is that one used the word a pair in a place where the other used the word ep a pair. Both are often translated since, but I had to discover, um, does this difference demand a difference that would show up in English translation? Does that make sense? Um, that was the point of the project. So um, uh, this is a project which is ongoing, in fact, and if you happen to have some real Greek uh, training under your belt, I need some more help, and I would love for you to volunteer. Uh, please let me know privately if that's the case. Um, but I had to discern. Are these two different words, or is it basically the same word spelled differently, or what's going on here? I did check BDAG, um, and I, I just wasn't happy with the conclusion uh, that they came to. Not that I necessarily thought they were wrong, but I thought I need to look for myself. The words have separate entries in BDAG, but I, I wasn't convinced that they are indeed separate words, um, or at least that there was a significant difference between the two, one that should show up in translation. So what I did was I searched uh, using Logos Bible software. I searched for instances of each word through the Bible word study tool in Logos, and I am going to show that to you now. In Logos Bible software, if I call up the Bible Word Study tool, and I look for a word like a pair, I am getting something that Donker never had, a useful and beautiful organization of the usage data. Here's a pair, here's how it gets translated in the ESV. Sometimes although, sometimes if it is true that, sometimes provided, sometimes if, sometimes since. If I click on one like since, I will see examples. Since God is one, since indeed God considers it just. Um, if it pops up in the Septuagint, I'll also see it there. I get root information, I get sense information from that Bible sense lexicon, and I should get in here somewhere, huh, I'm not sure why I'm not seeing epe pair. It may be being treated as one word by this lexicon. Here's um, epe de pair, which is also translated since sometimes. Um, that's helpful. In fact, let me, uh, if I click on one, what, do I, what am I going to see? Oh, it's just another Bible word study. Okay. Um, Bible word study is the the quickest and easiest and most beautiful way to look at how a given word is used in the New Testament, in the Septuagint. We're talking about Greek here. Of course, you can do the same for Hebrew. Um, you can see what prepositions are used with it, though this is um, a function word itself, so it's not going to have prepositions used with it. And you can do other textual searches <coughs> in the Septuagint, in the New Testament, in the Pseudepigrapha, in Josephus, in Philo. I mean, this is what you want. And then look at this, lemmas in passage, which I believe you have to have Logos now to have, uh, which is a special subscription service. It'll actually show you what commentaries discuss this word. And that would be especially valuable. Let's go back to Arsene Aquaites in the Bible Word Study. It's only used twice in the ESV, so there's only two elements to my graph. Um, it gives me root information uh, in the Bible Sense lexicon. And there's only one sense for it, so uh, only one shows up there. But if I look for lemmas in passage, this is going to show me all the commentaries which discuss this word. Why is that significant? Um, because these commentators are almost certainly going to be discussing the word not in general, 
that in this particular passage that I'm studying, and there's real value there. Um, it'll search the New Testament. It's only going to find two results in two verses. It'll also search the Apostolic Fathers. It doesn't show up in the Septuagint at all, so it's not going to find it. But I'm curious about this Apostolic Fathers reference. What, what is this? Oh, yeah, Polybius. In fact, uh, he's just quoting the New Testament, so that doesn't necessarily help me very much. But the Bible word study is the very best way to uh, study any given Greek or Hebrew word. Type in agape there, and you get all the same inf types of information. In addition, here's your nice preposition chart uh, showing you, you know, when is, when is the word n that is translated in used with the word agape, dia, ace, epi, apa, ek, kata. Uh, it, you can get all this information in dry lists in BibleWorks and in other uh, software, but you're not going to get it so neatly and beautifully arranged. I keep saying beautifully because I think that really makes it makes a difference. Um, I work for Logos Bible Software, and when I'm on their dime, I'm not allowed to say anything negative about BibleWorks or Accordance. And actually, both are very good pieces of software that I personally have used. And Dr. Arnold is an Accordance devotee, but I helped get him a review copy of Logos, and it seems to me that he was pretty excited about it and saw its value as well. Um, I would say, um, anticipating where we're going to go toward the very end of the hour, that um, don't look at anything aside from Logos and Accordance. Um, and you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to discuss that more when we get to the end of the hour. <clears throat> okay, that's the Bible word study. And I should do Bible word study because, uh, and I have some more information that I placed in the notes that you'll be able to read if you care to. Um, because you want to do at some points... You want to do the lexicographical work yourself. Yes, you know, use BDAG and LONIDA, and they know more than we do, and they're going to say uh, things that you wouldn't come up with on your own. However, if you will look at the usage data on your own, you will be able to make your own valuable observations, and, and usually what that means is you'll know with more certitude and with better sets of examples why LONIDA and why BDAG said what they did say. Uh, words matter, and doing your own lexicography is is going to be worth your time when you're really digging in. Okay, major shift here, which should have happened at the end of the hour, uh, uh, the crossing of the hours, but I spent too much time on previous material. We're going to talk very briefly about background books, then a little longer about translations, then commentaries, and Lord willing, I'll have time to talk again briefly about Bible software at the end. Um, Joel asked me to talk about background books. But I confess I am not a diligent reader of background books, books that focus on the historical, uh, literary, cultural background of the Bible. Now, these books I acknowledge are necessary because the general revelation of God's providence in history is authoritative too, just not authoritative in the same way that verbal revelation in Scripture is. But think about this. There is a, what I would call a hermeneutical spiral between history and the Bible. We are all the time trying to bring the two together. We interpret each in light of the other, <clears throat> as we talked about the hermeneutical spiral in an earlier lecture. So archaeological finds on one side of the spiral, um, they help illuminate the Bible text on the other side of the spiral, which in turn helps us interpret those archaeological finds. But archaeological finds are not inspired. Scripture is the, the final arbiter, the ultimate authority over all interpretation of all our experience, including what we dig up in the sands of Egypt or Israel, is the Bible. I'm reflecting my calling and gifting and training here by spending so little time on background books. I will just mention basically uh, two categories of them. One is background commentaries, and here the big name is the IVP Bible Background Commentary. And uh, I'll put that here in the chat. It focuses on ways in which our knowledge of history and archaeology and ancient cultures can illuminate the biblical text, and it's, it's worth having. Uh, the, next is, uh, the next category is Bible dictionaries and encyclopedias, and this, these I do use much, much more regularly than uh, background books. Um, I look up all kinds of people, places, and things in these Bible dictionaries, and I'm generally pleased with the help I get. The, the IVP Bible Dictionary series is probably my talk top recommendation. I also use the Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary. It's more liberal, um, but it's scholarly and authoritative, and, and 
when you look up Elam, like I did the other day, uh, a place mentioned in Jeremiah, um, the the liberal uh, bias of the of the writers is unlikely to show up very much, if at all. It's pretty straightforward. Um, Frequently, the info I need is so straightforward that whatever Bible dictionary comes up in Logos when I look up a word, that's just the one that I use. But I've got the Holman Bible Dictionary, I've got the Tyndall Bible Dictionary. I especially do value the IVP dictionaries, like the New Dictionary of Theology and the, uh, uh, what is it just called? The, the New Bible Dictionary in, uh, that IVP has put out. <clears throat> and that's it about background. Let's move on to my Briar Patch translations. And I am going to unabashedly plagiarize myself here. Uh, this, what we're about to go through, is material in the most popular blog post uh, ever among all those that I've written in the history of the Lagos Talk blog. And I've written now over 100 blog posts for them. And this one consistently gets lots of hits uh, day after day after day because people are asking the question that I ask in the title, which Bible translation is best? All the good ones. We're supposed to be talking about exegetical tools, <clears throat> and translations of the Bible are my go-to first level for exegetical tools. Mm -hmm. um, they, they are the very first thing that I turn to. Before I turn to lexicons, before I um, look up anything in a, in a dictionary, a Bible dictionary, before I use any commentaries, I use translations. I always have multiple translations available to me. Um, that is the one thing I miss the most about Bible Works, although Logos can now do it with the text comparison tool. Uh, but what I really liked about Bible Works was that it the, the the workflow was set up around using multiple Bible translations. And I and and I watched uh, Dr. Bob Bell at Bob Jones do this so often, and Dr. Randy Levy, um, that it finally dawned on me I ought to be doing this too. And for, for years, I've been doing this and finding great profit in it. In fact, um, because, of my, uh, because of the great profit that I've found in using multiple Bible translations, I found my something, myself on something of a, of a crusade, a crusade, a mission to end Bible translation tribalism. And if you don't know what I mean, see if any of these tribal stereotypes, some of which I borrowed from uh, Scott McKnight, another blogger, uh, New Testament scholars, see, see if they ring true for you. And I am curious, um, and please do mention this in the, uh, in the, um, in the comments. The, here, here's a, a little schema. Yeah, thank you, you found that. In fact, if you wanna click on and follow along, it might even help. The NIV 2011 is associated with, uh, it, it's the Bible of the broad swath of centrist evangelicals. The TNIV is the Bible of egalitarian leftist evangelicals. The ESV is the Bible of complementarian conservative neo-reformed evangelicals. The NASB, New American Standard, is the Bible of conservative evangelical serious Bible students. You might want to toss the word nerd in there. The KJV is the Bible of fundamental independent Baptists. The Holman Christian Standard Bible, now called just the Christian Standard Bible is the Bible of Southern Baptists. The New Living Translation is the Bible of seeker-sensitive evangelicals. The Net Bible is the Bible of computer nerds. The New Revised Standard Version and Contemporary English Bible are the Bibles of Protestant mainliners. And I think there is a little truth in every one of these somewhat tongue-in-cheek stereotypes. <clears throat> there really are different groups in Christianity, and there really do have differences. And I don't think it's completely accidental that each of these groups would gravitate toward particular translations. Um, and the, the common translation continuum uh, that you've seen out there probably, and I will share my screen. And actually in this case, I'll just let you follow along in my notes. Uh, this, this, this continuum right here that goes from literal translations to more functional or dynamic, from formal to functional, I think there's some real use in it. It's, gen it's, it's useful as a rule of thumb, but it's potentially misleading. Aha, and I've got a little error in my, there we go. Um, it's potentially misleading because it, it makes people think that there's some sort of moral value invested here, particularly conservatives in my experience, but also um, those not so conservative. They tend to think that um, this is a scale of more moral to not quite so moral, from good to bad, 
or vice versa. And that just isn't the case. I want you to think, I urge you to think of these different Bible translations on this continuum um, with this in mind, pragmatism, use. What is most useful for a given task? <clears throat> Somebody left a chat message. Let me get this up. Uh, yeah, they're amoral. Well, boy, when I say they're amoral, oh, oh, oh. No, because every choice a human makes is, has got some morality in it, but we're, we're close enough. Instead, I'd rather use the category, uh, prag the pragmatic category, the useful category. People who use one translation exclusively need to see the value in others. And John Glass, you're totally right that pragmatism is a, is a loaded word, but I want to use it in a strict, uh, in a strict sense, meaning useful. Um, I, I do have a pragmatic perspective on these um, because these, all of these are, are moral, okay? That is, these are all good translations. As long as I get to finish the sentence, what they are good for, good for preaching to a middle-class educated congregation, um, good for the use of evangelism um, would be a different one, um, good for the use of reading big chunks of scripture at once, and immediately I think of the NIV. Um, good for uh, uh, an all-round um, Bible for just about anything. I think the Holman Christian Standard Bible is, is like that. Uh, whereas uh, the NASB, which is very useful for study, is not so useful for evangelism. And actually at my old church, um, one of the very few things I ever complained about at that church, which was a wonderful church, and some of you went to it, including Joel Arnold and Ping Mian, uh, Mount Calvary Baptist Church, pastored by the, the best expositor I've ever experienced, Mark Minnick, and a major mentor in my life. One of the things I complained about there uh, to one of the assistant pastors was that we used the New American Standard in evangelistic ministry to uh, low-income uh, people who, who were in some cases functionally illiterate. And we taught, I taught myself um, dozens and dozens, maybe into the hundreds, seriously, of boys, this, this, these, these words from the NASB, keep sound wisdom and discretion so they will be life to your soul and adornment to your neck. Then you will walk in your way securely and your foot will not stumble. And personally, I think that is unnecessarily difficult English for, um, for these boys, seventh grade boys with no dads, who don't do very well in school. Um, and if our purpose is to evangelize them, then I wanna use something like the New Living Translation. And in fact, I don't know that I've ever actually sat down and read Proverbs 3, 21b through 23 in the New Living Translation. So I'm gonna do that. Let's see how much easier it is. My child, don't lose sight of common sense and discernment. Hang on to them for they will refresh your soul. They are like Jewels on a necklace. They keep, your, keep, keep you safe on your way, and your feet will not stumble. I think that's easier to understand for just about anybody than, uh, than the New American Standard Bible is. Um, they are like jewels on a necklace is easier to understand than, uh, how did it go? Um, they will adorn your neck. Um, no, nobody ever in that community uses the word adorn. And is it technically more accurate? Well, no, if it's meaningless, it's technically inaccurate. And I would try to explain, and there were just too many words to explain. Uh, I just couldn't do it. So I prefer this translation for that kind of setting. For an educated congregation, maybe not so much. Maybe they can handle um, the word adorn. I think that they can. Some comments here. Would I consider the ESV easy to read? Uh, yes and no. I think that it is a contemporary translation and therefore is written in vernacular English, and that's excessively important. Um, I refuse to use in public ministry, unless I'm absolutely forced to, and sometimes I am, I refuse to use a translation that doesn't use contemporary English. Um, uh, but the ESV, because it's so literal in places, isn't always as easy to understand as some others. And so I, for my own understanding and for that of others, I frequently make recourse to other translations. 
Joseph asks or says, when there are translations made specifically for mission fields and ESL readers like those in Southeast Asia, for example, the CEV. Um, yeah, I would, before you preach a passage from uh, a translation like that made for English as a second language readers, I would just make sure that you're not going to have to stumble over your words, that you're not going to have to disagree with the translation. Um, so I wouldn't select that for regular preaching because you'll, you're, you're, you'll get yourself in some odd situations. However, I used the New International Readers version. That's the N-I-R-V. I'm going to put that there in the, in the notes, and I'm going to pull it up here. The New International Readers version. Let's see how it handles Proverbs 3.21b through 23. <clears throat> My son, hold on to good sense and the understanding of what is right. Don't let them out of your sight. They will be life for you. They will be like a gracious necklace around your neck. Then you will go on your way in safety. You will trip and not fall. Look how many sentences that is. One, two, three, four, five, six sentences for what in other translations is very possibly one sentence. That is one of the major purposes of the New International Reader's Version, to shorten sentences for easier understanding. Um, I think they themselves recognized in an, in, that in an earlier edition, they went a little too far. Um, that not all long sentences are hard to understand, but I used this translation for several years of weekly preaching to functionally illiterate adults in Greenville, South Carolina, and it was absolutely a literal godsend. I was grateful to God for this every single week because I could explain the Bible rather than explaining the English. Go for understanding. All right, I'm on, I'm on my hobby horse officially. So turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 14, and I'm going to go ahead and pull up uh, what feels the most natural to me and where I spend most of my time, which is the ESV. But I could easily use the NIV. And in fact, I want to use the King James here too. I just said I refuse to use it, uh, but I'm gonna make a small exception for a good reason. Okay, I've got some of my Logos highlights uh, showing up here. Now, where did that word go? Nope, 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 nope. Come on, I can't, why can't I not see it? I'm gonna have to search. Okay, duh. 1 Corinthians 14, 9. Okay, in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul is contrasting the, the tongue speakers and the comparatively little value that they bring in edification to the church. So going back to the ESV here, he says, you know, by all means pursue and desire these spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Why, Paul? Because one who speaks in a tongue doesn't even speak to men, but to God, because no one, no, nobody understands him. He utters mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. This is the fundamental um, dichotomy Paul is making. Building up yourself has some value. you got to do it. But building up the church is what you do when you go to church. That's your purpose. He says, now, I'd love for you to all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. Why, Paul? He hammers this. Because the one who prophesies um, is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets, so that the church may be built up. He just keeps saying the same thing over and over. How am I going to benefit you? unless I give you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching in a language that you can understand. That's the implication here. If even lifeless instruments such as the flute or the harp do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? Verse nine, with yourselves, if with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? You will be speaking into the air. I love the way the King James puts this and I think it is so ironic. Likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it known, how shall it be known what is spoken? That 
that principle right there ought to apply to your use of Bible translations in preaching. There are parts of the Bible that are never going to be easy to be understood, but there are parts of the Bible that we make much more difficult when we choose a translation to use in public ministry that is unnecessarily difficult. Why would we be putting more obstacles in the way of people's understanding of the Bible? It, honestly, it blows my mind. And, and it humbles me because I didn't always see it. I used to be King James only. Um, it took me many years to get past that fully in my conscience and in my thinking. But after many years of experience in evangelism, especially with people who didn't have the educational opportunities that I did, I came to see the absolute value uh, that Paul raises here of edification and how closely he ties edification to intelligibility. If someone cannot understand, yes, it's possible that their, their difficulty in understanding is due to lack of motivation or downright unregenerateness. But we should not use that as an excuse when we have much easier to use and understand translations right in our pockets. Um, I will tell you about one time when I broke the rules. I was at a Christian camp in Brevard, North Carolina, which some of you will know, a wonderful place where godly staff members serve 10,000 campers a year. Actually, I think it's more than that now. And this is 20 years ago. And the rule was because there were churches that were sensitive and wanted only the King James to be used, that that was all we could use in, in our public ministry, counseling or preaching or teaching. And I followed that rule until one night I had a boy who came forward after a service, you know, interested in talking about his soul. And I was counseling him. And um, I dutifully pulled out my King James and had him read a particular passage for me because of the answering a spiritual question he had. And I'll never forget the look on his face. Like what in the world is this? Because this boy had not grown up in church. He did not go to church. King James language was utterly foreign to him. And at that moment I said, there is a greater law here than um, pleasing churches that are sensitive about the King James. Uh, shall we obey uh, men rather than God. And I pulled out a copy of the New American Standard, which I happen, happened to have, which sadly was not all that much easier than the King James, but it surely was. At least it sounded like PBS instead of like Shakespeare. And I had him read that. And we didn't have that problem anymore. He just was able to read the passages. Um, I tie edification to understanding. And I am on a crusade to get others to do the same thing. <clears throat> Now, let me turn off my uh, screen sharing, and because of that, uh, because of that hobby horse, I may have just wasted a lot of your time that we were going to use to talk about other things. Um, but let me, let me end uh, this section talking about translation by, by doing a little more expl explaining about how we can get out of Bible translation tribalism, because um, when... I, 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 am, I'm, I suspect that anybody around the world um, who's in a multi-translation situation or who one day will be is going to find that certain Christians um, unhealthily equate their translation with the word of God. Now, you've got to be very careful because their translation is the word of God. They're right. But it's not the word of God at the ultimate point. At the ultimate point, it's the Greek and Hebrew. The English, insofar as it reflects the Greek and Hebrew, um, is the word of God. And we should have confidence in our good translations. We have so many of them. Um, but we can't equate the two such that uh, there, there can only be one good translation of the Bible. How can we, how can we get out of this translation tribalism? It is by rigorously stopping ourselves and those that we have influence over, the sheep that we shepherd, from asking the wrong question, which is, which Bible translation is best? Maybe you could say that that question is not entirely wrong. It's just incomplete. You need to finish it. Which Bible translation is best for preaching? 
Which one is best for evangelism? Which one is best for reading through in a year? And you know what? Very rarely is there going to be one that is absolutely best, even when you ask those pragmatic, useful questions. Um, you, but you can get more specific. Which English Bible translation is most useful for preaching to these particular people? Which English translation is most useful for evangelizing this person I just met? Which one is most useful for reading through this year, given that I just read a more literal version last year or a more paraphrastic version last year? You've got to place Bible translations in the category of the useful, not in the category of the one ring that rules them all and in the darkness binds them. No, 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 no. Um, and that, it's going to take you years to get that question completely out of your mind, I have found. I found that I was implicitly asking that question all the time until with some real rigor I, I knocked it out. Um, I have written a book, and uh, it's going to come out, Lord willing, in January of 2018. It's called Authorized, the Use and Misuse of the King James Bible. And anybody who's interested in English Bible translation, no matter what you think, of the King James, I think we'll find this useful and interesting. I just got the cover yesterday from the designer. I'm going to show it to you. And um, I would love for you all to read it and give me your thoughts on it when it comes out. Let me pull up that chat again here. Somebody just asked a question. Matthew, how do you handle which question to preach from in a group of people? Look for the one that best matches the group. Yeah, Matthew, um, in the, in those among those functionally illiterate uh, adults, the NIRV was the best. Among a conservative, educated congregation, like there are many in Greenville, I tended toward the more literal. Um, if I don't know in advance, I probably want to choose a more centrist translation like the NIV, the New International Version, or the Christian Standard Bible, because I don't know what I'm going to experience. And I found with the NIRV, New International Reader's Version, that I did not have to correct it. Um, I was a little afraid of that getting into it, but I preached almost all the way through Romans, and I preached basically through the entire Old Testament, picking out the high points. And I don't think there was a single time when I had to disagree with the translation, maybe one. Um, <clears throat> but I was able to do that without casting doubt on it. Um, that's a good question. Yeah, just spend time in the translations, and I, I think the answer will become clear to you. And I've got 15 minutes to talk about commentaries and about Bible software. Um, so there's going to be more material in the notes that I don't actually get through. <clears throat> but let me talk about why we need commentaries. Um, I have some great Spurgeon quotes that you're just going to have to read on your own. But I want to get uh, mention one thing that he says. He basically mocks people who are not willing to use commentaries. And he says, uh, you are not, he says to his, his students at the pastor's college, you are not such wiseacres as to think or say that you can expound scripture without assistance from the works of divines and learned men who have labored before you in the field of exposition. If you are of that opinion, namely that I don't need commentaries, pray remain so, for you are not worth the trouble of conversion. And like a little coterie who think with you would resent the, the attempt as an insult to your infallibility. I have known at least one pastor who was like this. He had basically two commentators that he trusted. Thankfully, he at least trusted somebody else, but, but he would never mention anybody else. Um, and he was always the final authority. He always set himself up uh, as infallible. This was not my pastor. He was never my pastor. Um, there was an, air, an unbelievable arrogance in there that just bled into everything the poor guy did. Spurgeon says, it seems odd that certain men who talk so much of what the Holy Spirit reveals to themselves should think so little of what he's revealed to others. My chat this afternoon, he's speaking to them in a, in a kind of a fireside chat, is not for these great originals, but for you who are content to learn of holy men taught of God and mighty in the scriptures. Spurgeon is just so right. He hits all the right notes. He alludes very artfully to scripture when he talks about holy men taught of God and to Apollos, who is mighty in the scriptures. And, um, and he's so right because he sets up two poles. As he goes on, he says, um, it, you know, yes, it is possible to treat the great commentators as Christian Targums. Uh, and he says, however, that's not the danger of our time, slavishly following accepted guides. and 
And he's basically saying that's what Jewish tradition does. And I think he may say the same of Roman Catholic tradition. Conservative Roman Catholics slavishly follow accepted guides. Uh, and we can't do that. We're Protestants. Um, but we, we've got to have a balance here. A respectable acquaintance with the opinions of the giants of the past, Spurgeon says, might have saved many an erratic thinker from wild interpretations and outrageous inferences. Um, and, and, and those are the poles. You can slavishly follow the commentaries, or you can go out on your own as a lone ranger and come, out, come up with some crazy stuff. You want to be in the middle where um, commentaries are recognized as written by humans, and so they're not perfect, but you're not going to ignore them either. Uh, you're going to, you want to use their gifts. Um, it is possible to make void the word of God by the tradition of commentaries, but it's also possible for God to offer you this gift of Bible teachers, Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. These Bible teachers are God's gift to you. All are yours, according to 1 Corinthians 3, 21. Um, it's possible for you to, 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 to put your hand up like this and say, no, God, I don't need your gifts. What a travesty. Uh, when a given church or, or a larger group of Christians um, develops the, the attitude that we don't need scholarship, we don't need commentators, this is anti-intellectualism. It is arrogant. It is wrong. It is self-harming. This is something to watch out for in your churches. Um, let me make a, a comment here. Um, I have even heard good preachers who are good men and not arrogant. Um, I've heard them harm the faith of their people in the gifts of good Bible teachers by constantly setting themselves up as the final arbiter of opinion on the Bible constantly disagreeing with commentators and shaking their heads and saying, oh, I just can't believe that this commentator would say that. Sometimes it's okay. It's a way of warning against treating commentators as targums, um, as this accepted and authoritative body of tradition. But I think, it, I think it's usually doing, doing more harm than good. That It's that kind of attitude which taught my female friend years ago to say, oh, commentaries, Writing commentaries, I can't think of anything more boring. Well, that's ridiculous. Spending years of your life studying the Bible? How could that possibly be a waste? No, commentators are valuable. And I want to give a few major reasons why I check commentaries, why I value them. One is that they provide a referendum and a reality check on interpretive issues. Sometimes I just want to find out, is my idea crazy? Has anyone else ever had this before? And if none of the commentaries take my interpretation that I'm entertaining, uh, so far, at least in my life, I've been humble enough to, to assume that I'm the one who's wrong. Second, commentaries dig into the grammatical details with expertise that you and I are not always going to have, no matter how much study we've done. Commentators are gifted and trained, and they've been able, in God's providence, to spend their lives in sometimes very narrow niches of scholarship. Uh, though, and that's necessary to speak with knowledge and authority on some difficult issues, like like the rendering of the word stoicheia in Galatians 4.3, which is very difficult, and it's in a couple other passages. Uh, third, and closely related to the previous point, good commentaries dive into the history of interpretation whenever that's helpful. Sometimes it isn't helpful, and, and sometimes I read the ancient Christian commentary series edited by Thomas Oden, and I think to myself, what were these church fathers thinking? This allegorizing is just wild. I don't have enough creativity to read the text like this, and I don't want to. But sometimes, as with the two excellent commentaries on the Psalms that happen to be included in all Logos space packages, uh, Bruce Waltke and James Houston wrote these, when commentators go to the trouble, which is what James Houston's job is in that series, of including insights from long dead interpreters, it really helps you see the text in a new light. Because grasping the meaning of a text of scripture means knowing what to do with it in your own life. If you can't apply, you shall not steal to stealing donuts, and now I'm stealing, stealing an illustration from John Frame, then you don't understand, you shall not steal. Watching how others have used the text of Scripture faithfully in the past, centuries past, can be very helpful. And I have in the notes an example of um, uh, how I did this in Psalm 44 and found the, the use of that text in the past by long-dead Christians to be very helpful. And fourth, 
I value commentaries because they're exceptionally good sometimes at laying out the interpretive options. Cranfield on Romans is the best example of this that I know of. He's so grammatically granular. It's just fantastic. And you, you might not come away with the answer, but you will get the options. And there might be eight, there might be two, there might be six, there might be four. Um, Cranfield is just great at that, grammatical options. How do you find commentaries? Well, that's why I sent you to bestcommentaries.com. You could do very little better than just to make sure to get the top two commentaries that it recommends on every Bible book. It has a special page for that. Um, it distinguishes between technical and devotional commentaries. You want to make sure that you get commentaries that you can handle. But I would encourage you, if you're taking uh, an advanced course, um, then probably you can handle, um, or at least you have the potential to handle, some more difficult technical commentaries, even if they teach Greek and Hebrew. Set those up as your goal. Um, to be to be not only a very faithful expositor of the word in your nation, um, but to be a leader of other pastors. Um, and I'm not saying you should aspire to have a grand seat. I'm saying you do your work, you're diligent, and you will stand before kings. Uh, be diligent in being the kind of person who can use commentaries. Uh, like we talked about the value of the original languages, that's, that's one of your goals, should be one of your goals. You should be able to use commentaries uh, and understand them. Um, if you do that, you're going to find riches and riches and riches. Where should you buy commentaries? And here I'm going to get into Bible software. Commentaries are reference works, which you only read a little bit at a time. <clears throat> Some people read them straight through. I've never been that person. Uh, sometimes I wish I were, but I'm not. I check a bunch of them on uh, a given passage at once. Every once in a while, I check like all 60 that I have on judges just to get a, a plebiscite, a referendum, a vote on a given passage. Um, and because I'm only checking a, a short portion at a time, not reading it all the way through, I definitely find that software is the best way to access commentaries like all reference works. Um, I do not read many books straight cover to cover in Logos Bible software. Frankly, I believe I've done it one time. I'm now doing it for a second and third time, I think, with different books. Uh, I do read Kindle books cover to cover, as it were, um, because I have a Kindle, a physical Kindle right here that I really, really love. Um, I wish I could read uh, within the Logos ecosystem on my Kindle. <clears throat> it used to be there was a little more integration between the two, but it was never super convenient. Um, but for reference works, I definitely highly recommend Logos. Now, I work for Logos Bible Software. The parent company is called Faith Life. I'm going to go there, Lord willing, uh, in as little as 40 minutes. Um, but um, I am not saying this out of bias because I put several thousand dollars of my own very hard-earned money into Logos before I ever thought I'd work there. Uh, and in fact, I haven't bought all that many books since I've gotten there um, from Logos. But, I, but when I buy reference works, I buy them in Logos. Uh, there's no cheaper way to get commentary sets than to buy them in a Logos base package. I personally recommend getting platinum if you can possibly afford it, and then supplementing it with several commentary sets and journals and other books as needed. Um, and again, I can give personal testimony that I've done this. I said earlier that the only serious Bible software options available are Logos and Accordance. Um, Bible works I used to include there. I used to give multiple, I could give a, I used to give six hour day long training sessions on Bible works. I did that multiple times, but Bible works has not changed appreciably in so many years. Uh, and it doesn't play super nicely with Mac. It's okay. Uh, and the books in it are ugly and the, the whole software is aesthetically deficient. And I now speak not as an employee of Logos Bible Software, but as a lover of Bible software in general. Once I go back to being on the clock at Logos, I can't say anything negative about Bible Works. Um, but there, there you have it. There, those are my assessments. I do still love those guys. They're fantastic. They're good conservative Christians. And I do still use Bible Works. I believe I have it open on my computer right now for a very specific textual criticism project I'm working on. Um, and I do miss its powerful command line. And although Logos has a command line, it's just not quite the same. So uh, if you land a copy of Bible Works, great. But what I recommend is Logos. I, lo I recommend it over Accordance because it has a bigger selection of books, and I think it's a better bet for the future.
<clears throat> I hope Accordance lasts. I really do. And I, I think they will for a long time. They have a lot of dedicated users, including Dr. Joel Arnold. Um, but um, more and more, here's, here's the reason why I'm recommending it. I'm presuming that most of you are training for some kind of um, pastoral ministry or you're already in pastoral ministry. And if that's the case, and if you're as connected as you appear to be, and if cell phone usage continues on its uh, trajectory, then what you're looking for in Bible software is not just a standalone piece of software, but to buy into an ecosystem which will serve you and your church well. And Logos is doing that. Faith Life, the makers of Logos, um, we are now just starting to provide a whole suite of software tools for your church, including an awesome presentation software called Proclaim, which integrates really well with church website software and sermon hosting software in particular. It's really quite amazing what Proclaim and Sound Faith, our two products, can do together. And I worked closely and intensely on this as a consultant, as a preacher myself. Uh, and other exciting things I can't even tell you about, you just have to trust me, that are, that are coming. They are putting together a whole platform um, because that's, that's the way things are going. And Accordance, uh, if they even are able to play catch up, and I hope they are, because competition is good for us. It's good for the church. It presses us to do better. Um, but right now, the only platform that promises that is Logos. So um, let me just tell you briefly that you can get Logos Basic for free. And I'm going to put that uh, in the notes. I'm going to give you a, a link to Logos Basic. But actually, you can just go to logos.com forward slash basic and, and find it. All, all our apps are free. What's not free is the books. You have to buy the books. You do get some books with Logos Basic, but you will want to invest um, in the, frankly, the most expensive um, base package that you can possibly get and build up to it over time. Um, there are some other good options out there. Lumina is online Bible software, which if you absolutely cannot afford anything like Logos, you could get it. Use that. The Bible web app from John Dyer, this is also in the notes, is good. But Logos itself is coming out now with a web app, uh, which is um, which has taken great leaps in usability in just recent months. My company has been putting a lot of time into it. It is 7 o'clock a.m., and I have come to the end, but I do want to make sure I answer any questions. Does anybody have any quick questions before we finish up? I'm not seeing any. So I will hand it back to you, Joel. I hope this is beneficial for you. I will very shortly put up all the notes. I might even be able to do it while Joel is talking. Take it away, Joel. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, immense amount of work, clearly, that is there and immense amount of expertise that we also have. Um, I'm very glad that you have written notes as well, just because this is this is good, informa good information to be able to hang on to that way. Um, okay, so we are looking forward again to Dr. Ward coming back, and that will just be uh, this coming Monday. Um, again, very much appreciative of his hard work that's represented in doing two consecutive classes, getting up early and coming out to do that time and if you're not thinking of it right now that's fine if you want to email send it through Moodle you can do it on the Moodle page anyway uh, if, if you're my friend on Facebook do it that way and I will make sure those questions get over to Dr. Ward this is probably as good a time as any to say if you have questions from any of his lectures on Monday that will be his last lecture with us so this is a, a really good time if you have a final question you want to know uh, go ahead and get it by message, and then I will re relay it on to him. We'll make sure that some of those questions can get answered in his final lecture. And um, we will look forward to hearing more from him when that time comes. Okay, without further ado, I will let the, I will bid adieu. I will close out the time, and we will see you all back on Monday. Thank you again, Dr. Ward, for your time. Thank you to each participant who tuned in, and we'll look forward to talking more then.